Hey, just a little disclaimer here, I'll be using clips from both the Japanese version and the international version of this game. The only difference is some of the text and some minor graphical differences. Sometimes I just show whichever is funnier or more interesting. I know some of you are going to notice the minor inconsistencies and be like, what? So just so you know, that's why. Trust me, this game is weird enough without my help. Misleading someone about Trio the Punch is like trying to slander Donald Trump. Crazier things are probably true. The lies take legitimacy away from the stuff that's real, and the target is shameless anyway. That's all I wanted to say. Enjoy the video. Donald Trump is a werebeaver. We're video games. Trio the Punch. Never forget me. This is the weirdest game I've ever played. I know reviewers like to use hyperbole. This is the worst game ever made! No, I say this without exaggeration. This is the weirdest right here. Those who have followed this show have seen the absolute absurdity endemic in video games. But this is it. This is the game that made me want to review weird games in the first place. Almost a thousand games have been recommended, researched, and or played in my search for the weirdest games out there, which by the way, I've been doing since 2006, nine years ago. And this is still firmly number one. I don't doubt that one day I, I may find something out there even weirder, but for now, this is it. So I hope you're ready. Trio the Punch, never forget me. What does the title mean? Well, obviously the title makes no sense grammatically. It's English to the extreme. These are the words that come out when Segata Sanjiro punches the Alpha Getty out of a preschooler. Japanese games tend to be badly translated, although usually, if anything, they're more careful about their titles since that's the one thing everyone's gonna see. There are only a few games I can think of that have titles this mangled, and half of them are coded messages to assassinate Gabe Newell. For it to be grammatically correct, Trio the Punch would have to be a character named Trio who is an anthropomorphic punch, a living embodiment of hitting something with your fist. I can't even envision this. Sure, you can imagine it as a sentient fist, but a fist is at least a thing. This game has me trying to make some kind of superhero out of a verb, and we still haven't gone past the title. There are three characters. I guess that's what the trio means. And it's a beat-em-up, which I guess is what the punch means. And never forget me means... I think it means they went out of their way to make this game memorable, because your perceptions of normality are going to be permanently tainted by this game. One day you may be 65 years old, living a cozy life with your loved ones in a quaint, quiet little house that's not too big and not too small, enjoying simple pleasures such as having a nice meal with your family and talk about your lives and your dreams, and out of nowhere you're going to be hit with the memory of a team of tiny tiny men carrying a giant living statue that shoots fireballs out of its big toe which turns the shredder from Ninja Turtles into a piece of wood. What I just described to you is the first level, and it's not even close to as weird as it gets. So let's talk about the characters. There's a ninja. He might not be Shredder from Ninja Turtles, but he's totally Shredder from Ninja Turtles. There's also a street fighter. He might also be a breakdancer or an early 90s DJ. He looks like Luke. Hey. Yeah, he does look like Luke. Hey Luke, cameo. Tom? What game are you dragging me into now? This had better not be that one with Colonel Sanders. Trio the Punch. That game with all the weird... No. 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 I am not. And our final character is the Russian from Rocky IV armed with a sword. Or something. I don't know. The ending cutscene tells you his name is Rose Sub, which sounds less like a name for a Conan and more like Tuxedo Mask Subway Order. Despite having a sword in the player select screen, he actually begins play armed with a burning stick. Or as scholars call it, a stupid burning stick. It's not a flaming club or anything, it's just a stick. Enough of a breeze and you're left with a fire-weakened piece of brittle wood. This guy can cough and his weapon is now a handful of charcoal. This guy is named Santos, and he just uses his fists, but he's much faster. And finally, Shredder is the fastest, and he uses a tiny dagger, but when you attack while in midair, he throws Shuriken instead. This is the character you want to be. He's the fastest, he's the only one with a ranged attack, he has a perpetually forward-leaning stature, 
He goes perfectly spherical every time he jumps, and he turns into a log every time he gets hurt. Best. 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 The wood thing is some sort of ninja thing. As far as I can understand, legend has it that ninjas used to use all manner of dummies and the like to attract enemy fire. And I guess over time, Japanese pop culture decided that it was usually a tree or piece of wood, and somewhere along the line it became a joke that any time a ninja would get hurt. Haha! <laughs> it was a log the whole time! Anyway, the first enemy you see is this big fat guy who breathes fire at you, and he inflates when he does so. I didn't know this the first time I played this, but this is actually Karnov. From the game Karnov. I reviewed Karnov. He's a crazy Soviet fire breather and professional Karnov. Here he's your first enemy, and actually the most common recurring enemy. Why did this game decide Karnov should be your constantly returning foe? I can't really say. Let's just say Data East employs some very weird people, and that's the best answer I can give you for 90% of what's going to be going on here on now. Now, whenever you defeat a Karnov, he disappears in a cloud of existential horror and shouts, YAY! Or, I don't know if that's what he says, but I'll be a monkey's uncle psychiatrist if it doesn't sound like it. Actually, all of the enemies in this game make either this noise or this other noise that sounds like, YO! That reminds me of that episode of The Tick with the two rival alien factions with languages that only consisted of one word each. What, what? What? What, 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 what? 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 What, what, what? <laughs> Some of these Karnovs, yes, there are multiple, leave behind a heart that says help. I don't want to hold up the review for every little thing here, but he leaves behind a heart that says help. I don't know if the heart itself is asking for help, or if it contains a life essence which is asking for help or if it somehow captures the last fleeting thought of his soul before it left his body. Either way, you collect it in order to progress. I don't know if this is some metaphysical thing, or if it's a metaphor, or if the designers just thought you should collect something, and they just picked a heart that says help at random by rolling dice on a series of tables. But that's what's going on on this side of the path itself. The level will loop infinitely until you collect enough hearts. That's what causes the boss to appear. And the boss is a giant statue of Karnov being carried by four tiny Karnovs which shoots fireballs out of its big toe. I guess the joke is that Karnov breathes fire from his mouth and his feet are like the opposite extremity. <laughs> you got us there, Data East. And this is the basic pattern of the game. Every level consists of you collecting hearts that say help until the counter goes down to zero and then a boss appears. And almost all of them wrap around infinitely in an endless cycle like in the Flintstones. Now, one kind of unusual thing is that you seem to be able to bounce off of any kind of enemy or projectile without getting hurt. I'm not sure why, it's just one of the mechanics of the game. I normally love to analyze this stuff and try to figure it out, but well, whatever. It's just how the game operates. Let's try to keep moving, folks. We got a lot to go through. This giant boss has the same tiny death smoke animation as everything else, and you're congratulated with the words win-win. Then you go to a roulette wheel. The possible tiles it can land on are life up, main up, down, sub up, down, and change. It spins around, lands on something good, I guess, and this gentleman down here yells out, Lucky cha-cha-cha. So now that that's happened, we move on to the next level. Do you get an idea of what kind of pace insane stuff happens in the game? You really don't get much time to soak it all in before a new blindfold gets slapped on your face, you're spun around until you get dizzy, and then you're shoved blindly into a whole new world of unspeakable absurdity. The next level has a series of raising and lowering pipes, and just one very tiny Karnov who's looking away. If you're the ninja, you can snipe him from afar. Otherwise, if you try to sneak up on him, he breathes fire on you and then turns upside down, and just kind of floats there, upside down, for some reason. If I didn't know better, I'd have thought it was a glitch. When you beat him, the boss is a giant green fist. Next level, you're running around some active volcanoes with flying Karnovs with wings whose heads go huge when they breathe fire, and then they fly down and punch you like Superman. Oh, this upside down guy is back too. If you get hit by volcanic debris, I don't know if it's lava or rocks or what it is, a little star floats around your head. You'd think this would mean you're stunned or something. 
No, the only effect is that it causes your next injury to do no damage. So, getting hit by lava is beneficial, except not really because you still take a point of damage when it hits you, so it's pointless. The boss has two skeletons with machetes, I think. I don't know. Whatever. The next level is called Poison, and you have purple Karnovs that shoot poisonous fire that turns you purple. The boss has a couple of tiny dragons. A curse of sheeps. Sure, let's just blindly accept that. There are more poisonous Karnovs, and the boss is a sheep that shoots little sheep as a projectile. Like all projectiles, you can jump on them without getting hurt, so here you are, great powerful warrior, repeatedly bouncing on tiny airborne sheep. I curse you! Oh, looks like I died. I guess I should... Oh. Yeah, so, uh, okay. And now I'm a sheep! Here I am, as a sheep, walking along on two legs and shooting tiny sheep as a projectile. This is the curse of sheeps. A sheep that shoots little sheep defeated me in honorable combat, thus cursing me to join the army of the were sheep that shoot little sheep out of their face. Before I continue any further, I think maybe I should talk a little bit more about these characters, and that roulette wheel after every level that allows you to upgrade them. Now, unless you're one of the people who made this game, you should have no idea what main up means. It just means that your main weapon gets upgraded. Life up means you regain health that you lost. Rookie, cha cha cha. Sub up is for your sub weapon, which in this case is one of those special attack everything attacks you can only do once per level. Down, or unlucky, lowers both your main and sub weapon. And finally, change means that it gives you the option of changing your character. You know, if you forgot to pick the ninja and wanted to make sure you're the ninja. If you're the ninja, which at this point you're probably the ninja, your dagger doesn't really get upgraded, just the shuriken. First, they grow to be huge. The second upgrade reduces them back to regular size, but now you get to throw two. That's the maximum upgrade, being able to throw two. Just ask your old master. I cannot do any better. As you might have guessed, the sword fighter upgrades from a torch to a sword, and then a larger sword. Then a Morning Star Flail, which doesn't look natural the way he's holding it. Is he holding it backhanded over his head? Is that like how gangsters hold guns sideways? I don't know. And finally, a torch again. Oh, except this one shoots fire. Okay, that's cool. You have to perfectly time this roulette wheel four times without ever accidentally hitting a three or five okay, cha -cha -cha. just to be able to attack at range, which the ninja can already do all the time. It's like if you were a member of the Justice League and your superpower was being able to fly, but only as long as you keep winning the lottery. The Puncher's first upgrade has him carrying around and slamming people with a garbage can. Or, wait, I think it's a punching bag. It says S-Bag, which can only stand for slamming bag, suplex bag, sandbag? Oh yeah, I get it, I get it. It's Santos's bag. I guess hitting people with a punching bag is better than with your fist in this universe. Next upgrade gives them Wolverine Claws, or Neils, as the game calls them. Sup, Neils. And his final attack, W Fist, means every time he punches, he slides forever at blinding speed. Luke, can you demonstrate? Of course not! I don't have the capability to do that! Don't ever speak of this again. Luke's special attack, if no, you can that call it that, me. is that his head grows to gigantic proportions and everything on the screen takes damage while he shouts, oof. Upgrade his sub-weapon and he has the same basic attack but also shoots characters that follow you around and home in on enemies when they appear on screen. Ivan Drago's special attack is that he summons a lightning bolt that... Actually, they all summon a lightning bolt. He just does the same thing as Luke does, no, except his head doesn't grow huge. Stop it. Stop it. When upgraded, it shoots out little bubbles in four directions. And later, when he upgrades from Crash 1 to Crash 2 to Bravo, it shoots out bubbles in eight directions. The ninja has by far the most interesting and varied specials. First, he summons a rock. He strikes a pose, lightning strikes, a big rock falls from the heavens, splits in two, and all the Karnovs in its path are vanquished. The next one is called Fire, and it creates four fire bubbles that orbit you and hit anything that comes near. 
Then there's double, which creates a clone of you, because one is the loneliest number. I guess it allows you to attack more frequently, so that's handy. Then there's bomb, which, as you would imagine, causes you to burst apart and all your limbs fly out and hit your enemies. Next is katana, which causes swords to shoot out of the ground, as they do. You may have noticed that all the specials more or less fit the motif of being a ninja, which is why the last special attack summons frogs. The name for this ability is... Sick... And... I get the feeling this is a badly translated attempt at saying it's one of the plagues of Egypt. As I mentioned earlier, if you try to upgrade your main weapon when you've reached the maximum level, your master tells you, I can't do any better. However, with your special attacks, if you manage to land on sub up, okay, and you're at the maximum level, it will cycle you through to the first one again. You go back to the worst one as a punishment for winning. Lucky. Cha -cha -cha. And it's not like if you accidentally land on down, it takes you back down to the top one again. No, as far as the game's concerned, you're at the bottom and can't downgrade any further. Thanks, Trio the Punch. So let's get back to the sheep. Let's say you don't lose. Win, win. I curse you. Yeah, you get cursed by that sheep whether you win or lose. You don't need to even touch it. Sheep lycanthropy is transmitted via thought, I guess. So you're a sheep for the next level, where you fight what I can only describe as a living totem pole. Look at this. Every part of this thing is doing something lunatical. From the bottom we have this weird rugby troll holding everything up and carrying it around. Then we have a punching gargoyle who shoots its fist right off, and some kind of snapping serpent, a goat skull, and a fish cyborg whose face peels back to reveal a laser gun that shoots fish! And on top is a gladiator that throws knives, and the final crowning piece is an evil unicorn head. Nothing could have prepared you for this. The game sometimes gives you hints about the next level, like poison and a curse of sheeps. Nothing in the game tells you, hey, heads up, you're about to face a superhero's entire rogue gallery stacked high like a plate of nefarious pancakes. They look like the undead little rascals trying to pass themselves off as an adult without doing you the intellectual courtesy of putting on an oversized coat. And FYI, if you hit any of these little sections, you can destroy them individually, stopping them from whatever they were doing. That means if you hit the one that does all the walking, the whole thing becomes stuck in place. This multifarious monstrosity of madness is kind of the crowning moment of weirdness in this game. So far. I mean, it's hard to get weirder than everything that's ever been weird in one column. Stay with me, we still got a long way to go. The next level is called Tortoise. You can see Karnov harassing a turtle. You tell him, don't do that. Karnov replies, I will anyway! Classic Karnov. So you vanquish Karnov, leaving a shell behind. So, now what? Um... Yeah, turns out a Kung Fu master was hiding inside that shell. Actually, it appears to be your master, the guy who gives you the power-ups and whatnot. His name is Mr. Chin. I don't think he's any relation to the Mr. Chin in Thunder and Lightning, since that was made by another company. But I'll let you all establish your own headcanon at your leisure. <laughs> headcanon. Among his repertoire of butt-kicking techniques is the ability to grow his foot to massive proportions. He also does what I like to call dirt surfing. He also throws Japanese at you, and he puts Dulcim to shame. And when he managed to land a hit, he does what awesomeness scientists would describe as the best thing ever. Okay, so you defeat him, and he admits, You're stronger! And you move on to the next level, where Karnov's don old diving helmets and generally do this. The next level is in the water, and... You have these abominations that can only have been created by a mad Nova Scotian occultist. The top half is a woman with a tiara making grandiose ballerina-like gestures. Or else she's trying to cast a spell. I don't... I don't. The woman half looks familiar. I mean, she kind of looks like Cheryl from Archer, but this game was made in 1990, so that's a coincidence. Or... She also kind of looks like Princess Diana. The bottom half is a giant freaking barracuda and it flies. This whole thing... Ah, what is this game? And then it spits globules of water at you that roll along the ground and that hurt you if you touch them. Whatever, just whatever. I have no emotional whatever with which I can actually even. If you attack them, their top half gets destroyed. Which 
incidentally, is not really the half that I have a problem with. Look at this! They just erased half of the graphic. Didn't even add any stump or anything. The graphic just gets cut off halfway through. It looks like this. Ah! It would have been relatively easy to draw a few extra pixels to fix this, but they didn't. And the part that blows my mind is I'm pretty sure they did this on purpose. Like, these guys are pretty good at sprite work. There's no way they just didn't know any better. After this, you come to a level where Karnov set bombs and then run away. If you just wait, they wonder why the bombs don't go off and run face first into their own explosion. I know in the game Karnov, you could plant bombs and they were kind of useless. I don't think that's what the joke was intended to be about, but there's some sort of comedy trying to happen here. The boss of this level is that big hand again, but this time it opens up and drops that same globule of water from the last stage. I guess when they went to the trouble of drawing and programming that little projectile, they wanted to get the most of it. Even though I can name like a dozen enemies they put a lot of effort into that we'll never see again. In the next level, a giant foot tries to crush you. No collecting hearts, so you go straight to a giant foot. It looks like it's part of a statue. Its sandal says, Tarosu... Tarosu no... Uh, uh, um... That. Taros seems to mean Talos from Greek mythology, who was a giant man made of bronze. And Ashi means leg or foot, so... He wrote Talos' foot on his foot. If it touches you, it shrinks you. And for some reason, the shrunk version of you gains a projectile attack, even if you didn't previously have one. I'm not sure why getting squashed by a corroded metal foot gives you the ability to Hadouken stars from your fist. You can defeat this leg by waiting for it to come down and then pelting it with projectiles, or you can do it Super Mario 3 style by letting it stomp its way through the ground. I don't know if it gets physically torn off of Talos' body or if you're only fighting its leg this whole time. Neither is outside the realm of possibility in a world where you launch miniature sheep out of your face at a walking totem pole made of schizophrenia. Actually, now that I think of it, you might have just been fighting various parts of Talos all along. I said that you fight the Green Fist twice, but reviewing the footage I can actually see that the first one was a left hand and the second was a right. So I guess we fought a Greek mythological bronze man that came pre-dismembered. I don't know anything about Greek mythology that would explain this, but if you've seen my Altered Beast video, you know I don't know much about anything but Greek mythology, period. So I consulted some people who have a little more expertise, and they told me, Jack, there's no explanation. You just seem to be fighting Talos' leg and probably his hands, because yes. Okay, we've now finished one of four parts of the game, so how are we for time? Crap. Um... Uh... Okay, now we get into the horror section of the game, which allows me to shoehorn this into a Halloween episode! <coughs> We're in a graveyard, and we fight zombies. Tall zombies, and short zombies. The short zombies pick up tombstones and chuck them at you. The boss says, what even is the entire what? I, uh, let's move on. The next level has a dude with a giant hammer, just for instance. Then we appear to be in some post-apocalyptic city with all the bad guys from Double Dragon. And still zombies. And more guy with hammer. Next! The moon is your friend. This message just seems completely random. In fact, I beat this game multiple times without discovering anything unusual in this level. Oh, I mean except for the zombies riding go-karts! But if you look carefully, you can see the moon up here in the corner of the screen. It's out of reach, so you can't do anything directly to it. But if you use your special attack at any time, which hurts everything on screen, the moon comes down and attacks you. Oh yeah, and it squishes you just like the big foot does. I don't know what of these things makes the moon your friend. Is it warning you not to hurt the moon with your special attacks or you'll be sorry? Or is it letting you know that you can get squished by the moon to gain midget superpowers? Next you're in a sewer. It must be New York because it has alligators in it. And more double dragon. And these two-faced zombie ghost monster things that barf ectoplasm. Ghostbusters was in New York, right? Right. That... That, that's Colonel Sanders, right? Does he just look like Colonel Sanders? It might just be a coincidence. What? Whoa! Oh! Oh, I... Oh, okay. Yeah, a chicken burst out of his chest, and now it's fleeing drumsticks at me. That was definitely Colonel Sanders. I guess it explains why this stage was called Bird Brain. 
Touching this chicken monster also shrinks you. Okay, when you were squashed by the giant foot or the moon, it made sense. Okay, well as much sense as one can make where getting squashed by the moon makes you tiny and gives you the ability to Kamehameha. It makes sense, relatively speaking. Getting crushed by something big makes you smaller. There's a kind of cartoon logic to it, but touching a bird? Can I ask for just a little bit of consistency in my game about the Shredder fighting Colonel Sanders? You're the best in the world. You're the best. Around. And nobody can ever do anything that can ever keep you down. Okay, now the Shredder is appropriately fighting Ninja Turtles. I mean, I'm not saying these are Ninja Turtles, but they're green and they're wearing... Yes, I'm saying they're Ninja Turtles. That was great! Okay, thanks. We're in the third section of the game now, which is the Ninja section. It's all ninjas around here. You'd think this would be the most normal part of the game. And then this happens. Weevils... fall... down. The... The, the game just froze. I can't move. Oh, there there I go. Weebles fall down. Hey! Stop that! What is this game talking about? Did I mention the ninjas that turn into frogs in this level? Yeah, it's a thing that's happening alongside the cryptic text that causes the game to freeze on you for several seconds. This does nothing to add to the challenge. The only purpose it could possibly have is to annoy you. And there's this guy. This is Daruma. It's a doll meant to represent the founder of Zen. It's a popular thing in Japan, and it shows up in all the weirdest Japanese games. I swear, this game fills out a whole checklist of all the recurring things I see in the weirdest games. Daruma, check. Lucky Cat, check. Eyes there where eyes should not be, check. Food being used for everything other than eating, check. Things shooting small versions of themselves as projectiles, check. Disproportionate body parts, check. Attacking with an inappropriate part of your body, check. Something that disguises itself as something else to trick you. Check. Living disembodied heads. Check. Living other disembodied body parts. Check, check, check. All that's missing is something musical, some mushrooms, and something that's been bizarrely sexualized. But anyway, getting back to Daruma. In the Japanese version, the text says Daruma-san, not Weevils. My best guess, when it was given its international release, they thought English-speaking audiences wouldn't have any idea what Daruma is, and they just told you it was a Weevil. Which makes sense if you assume that Weevils are common knowledge. I didn't know about them. Or that their catchphrase is, Weevils wobble but they don't fall down. Weevils wobble but they don't fall down. This all still doesn't even answer the question about why this text causes the entire game to freak these for several seconds at a time. It's not like Daruma's jumps cause anything to freeze. Actually, it turns out that in the Japanese version, it says Daruma-san ka koronda, or Daruma-san fell over, which is the name of a children's game like Freeze Tag or Red Light Green Light. When whoever's it says Daruma-san ka koronda, everyone's supposed to freeze. So yeah, it's just a joke that went way over my head. Oh, and Daruma also shrinks you. They just really wanted to make the most out of that mechanic. You know what they call it when you add a throwaway concept, but you just keep coming back to it despite the fact that nobody wants it? Yeah, this shrink thingy is the Jar Jar of Trio the Punch. That does okay. Oh. Thanks for the backhanded approval, Mr. Chin. Your fighting style is not at all preposterous. The next level is a bamboo forest where you jump on swords that are stuck in trees and fight ninjas that turn into snakes. Oh, and worm things. Delicious. And in case you're wondering where Lucky Cat comes into play, here you go. This level starts you off being unable to control yourself and walking to the right on your own. Lucky Cat is doing this with his ability to pull you towards it by shaking its paw. Oh, and did you know that touching Lucky Cat causes you to shrink? Because apparently that's really something they wanted to make sure you appreciate. Its paw blocks its face from getting damaged. Or his collar. Or whatever the ring is. So you have to time it right, or just hit its paw enough times to knock it off, I'm not sure. And it goes red and then it dies. Next level. Kung Fu Guy is back! Hey Kung Fu Guy! Skipping right past a few generic ninja levels, you end up on the roof fighting some sort of armored fish warrior. And then the fish statues come to life so you can fight more fish. Now the ninja area is done, and we can move on to... some kind of... starbase? Where you fight blob monsters. So, 
Let me just try to get this game setting straight. We pass through some ancient, possibly Greek temples where we fight Talos, then through a graveyard, jump ahead to a post-apocalyptic double dragon-like area, then go to a carnival, then feudal Japan, and now we're in space. Or some kind of blob laboratory. I don't know. I don't know why I'm trying to act like this can be explained. It could be a time travel thing, or maybe they just threw in whatever they wanted. Actually, let's add that to the list. Can't tell if it's a time travel thing. Check. So yeah, we're gonna be seeing blob monsters a lot. Here's some blue blob monsters. Here's some red ones. Here's a blob inside a robotic armored shell. Here's a yellow blob that turns into a lizard. Here are blobs that have bubble cannons. And let's throw in some mechs. Oh, and when you blow one of them up, it turns out a blob was piloting it the whole time. And a green blob that turns into two arms? It looks like part of the sword guy's graphics. And I seriously can't tell if it's a glitch. That's how crazy this game is. In most games, you see something like this and you know it's a bug. Here, it might be an intentional feature, but you just don't know. This isn't a thing that happened one time while playing this. It happens with frightening regularity. Don't think I don't know what a real glitch looks like. In that one level where if you die, the continue statue is invisible, that's a glitch. When a double dragon falls off the boundaries of the level and now you can't beat it, that's a glitch. When green blobs recurringly and exclusively turn into arms in a game where that sort of thing isn't even the weirdest thing you can find, I don't know. Eventually you end up in this abstract, extra-physical dimension of colors and shapes that float around in the ether while you fight even more robot blobs. Once we're finished with all that, the game takes you to a quiet little park where a little bird flies around peacefully. So naturally you kill it. The game's like, what? Then you kill a little doggy. Cruelty! Or... Cruity, rather. You take out a butterfly, and then after a dove comes up to the birdbath, you win! Well, the camera pans down to two gigantic, sinister eyes that have been watching you this whole time. And that's the game. I'm faint from hunger. Well done, well done. So you're just going to ignore the fact that there was a giant cosmic terror watching you from beneath the facade of a small park? That's great! Best we ever had! This doesn't even concern you guys. Was this the plan all along? What were those eyes? And can I remind everyone that we were just murdering cute, harmless animals? And if you are playing as a ninja, his reaction to all this is, Thanks for cheering me up! What are you- Superb! What can you possibly- ah! The moral to the story is the moon is your friend. Good night. Don't do that. I will anyway! Karnov will do that. Karnov does what he likes! Don't tell Karnov what not to do. Karnov will f your s**t up. Man, back in Russia, Karnov ate bear. Karnov ate giant head. Karnov was giant head. Karnov have really weird life. Then again, life never the same after Karnov drink that vodka released with ergot.